thank you so much, uh, Professor Adi, for being here with me today at on such a strange week of your life. Um, so, you know, you're the first history professor in Britain of African heritage, and also the same week you've been nominated for a prestigious Wolfson Prize. So why on earth do you think the University of Chichester has gone about and removed you from this position? To be honest with you, I, <clears throat> I can't really explain it to you. You'd have to ask the university. I can tell you uh, what they, the reasons they claim, but even those I find I'm, I struggle to actually explain, to, to give, even to give their explanation, um, because their, their basic explanation is that um, because I, I taught on a course um, which they claim didn't recruit enough students. They they basically claim that that course doesn't uh, you know pay for my salary, but that's a not not a very extensive salary. That that's their argument. Now, the the problem with that is that you know courses come and go at universities. They they some stay open, some close. It's very very unusual to tie the employment of a member of staff at a university to a one particular course mm. because clearly recruitment to a course is not the responsibility it's, it's, it's almost as if i'm being punished you know you didn't recruit enough students to this course therefore uh, we will punish you by ending your employment it's an extraordinary idea because you could say well who are the people who are responsible for for, for recruitment, you know, they are the, the, the director of marketing or the vice chancellor or the head of the department. Should they, therefore, should they lose their posts? You know, it's an extraordinary notion. Um, and then, of course, when you're, you know, I would say, uh, you know, a professor of some renown, it's very, very unusual in this country. I mean, there maybe there are examples of professors who are, you know, well regarded who are well you know well regarded for their teaching for their research for their publications for their <laughs> these things for all the work they do outside of universities uh, to be sacked yeah you know no, nobody can believe that it's just about recruitment and so on so it just doesn't add up but i mean that's how they they say it's just a question that they claim it's just a question of money i think the whole world outside of the senior managers of the universities to think that something else is going on. You know, mm. people have various theories. Somebody's out to get me. The vice chancellor doesn't like me. Um, they don't care about, you know, this particular type of history. They're under the influence of various politicians who are telling them we only need to have vocational degrees. There are, you know, all kinds of theories. Um, in a way, we can't um dwell too much on the reasons why <clears throat> everybody asks the reasons why mm. but or the motive who knows what the motive is but we know what the impact is yeah. we know what the consequence is and that is what is completely unacceptable we cannot accept that the only history cause of its kind in britain in europe is just dismissed a course which is trying to repair a problem that exists within academia, and I use academia in its widest sense, within the education system in this country, where young people of African and Caribbean heritage are uh, alienated mm. from studying history. That, that's the basic problem. That young black people in this country don't really like studying history. Mm. You know, we, did a survey eight years ago or so, we found that at university only agriculture and veterinary science were more unpopular subjects than history amongst black undergraduates. Mm -hmm. Now, if you know anything about, you know, African and Caribbean communities in this country, historically and today, it's like history is kind of the subject, everybody's interested in history. You know, there are heritage walks, there are all kinds of various projects, there are, you know, all kinds of things are going on. People are talking about history, people refer to history. 
there's an interest, but somehow young people have been put off and alienated. And we even held a conference about it in 2015, and people and we got young people to come and students to come and other people to come and to discuss. Okay, well, why is this? Mm. And everybody said, well, it's because of the Eurocentrism that, mm. that exists in the way that history is presented in schools, in universities, in the media, or isn't presented, is ignored, is hidden, and so on. And so at that conference, uh, people suggested having a course to attract people back. Maybe people who got put off history at school or university, but actually loved it, were very, very interested in history, to try and get them back, to train them so they could carry out their own research mm -hmm. or encourage them maybe to do PhDs. And so that's why we set up the MRES. And the MRES has done exactly what we intended it to do. All the students love it. We've recruited all from all over the world. We've particularly recruited in Britain. It's online. Anybody can access it. People who are at work, they've got kids, they've got whatever. They can come and do this course. And seven of them have gone on to do PhDs. Mm. Six of them at the University of Chichester. You know, five of them are actually still students at the university just at this moment. Which what more could you want? You know, and that's exactly what I wanted to ask you, which is what's going to happen to your students that are in the middle of their courses or just begun their courses? And the answer is nobody knows. Oh, God. Because the university is not telling them. It doesn't appear to have a plan, any plan for the students or claims that <clears throat> because they've sacked me um, and because... That, 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 that there's a procedure in place um, and everything is confidential and so they can't tell the students what they're going to do. I mean, nobody really believes that. And the fact is that what's that got to do with anything? If you sack somebody, mm. you have to have a plan in place to deal with the students who need supervision. They need supervision now, mm. not, you know, at the end of, you know, an appeal process or a legal process and so on. Because a legal process could go on for, for years. Mm. Um, it could well go on for years. So you have to have a plan in place and you have to put the students' minds at rest. This is what we're doing. This is what is in place. And the, the university can, has no plan in place and could not. The other thing is that they cannot have a plan in place because... All of those students came to the university to work with me. Mm. As I said, five of them came through the MRES. Um, one of them was an undergraduate student of mine. Others have come to the university specifically to work with me. Mm. So how is the university going to replace me? You know, not to uh, you know, brag, but there are very, very few people in Britain who teach our specialists, both in the history of Africa and the African diaspora, um, who the students would have confidence in. Yeah. There aren't, this is the whole problem. There aren't very many of us who do this stuff. You know, in fact, I'm the only person who teaches both the history of Africa and the African diaspora um, and has a record of doing it and so on. So to replace me, for all these different students have different areas of um, uh, different areas of specialization will be, I would say, impossible. Actually, impossible. And the university don't seem to have actually plan for that. Uh, don't have a plan. So uh, we don't know the answer. That's the, the short answer. And obviously, you've mentioned this, but why aren't there no degree courses actually focusing on the history of African or the African diaspora in Britain? And in terms of also, why aren't there why aren't there more like academics in this area? Well, the the there are of course courses on the history of Africa. There aren't many, mm. but there are some degree courses um, at. School of Oriental and African Studies, where I myself studied many Me years too. ago. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> um, there are courses which exist. They're, they're not that many, but there are some that exist at, at SOAS and other places. Um, they tend to focus on the African continent, mm. uh, 
they tend not to focus on the diaspora, whether that's in Britain or um, in the US or in the Caribbean or whatever. We, one of the things that we do, certainly with the MRES, is that we uh, link these two histories, which are often separated, and we look at them in a particular way. Uh, we encourage the students to do that. So um, nobody else does that in this country. In the US, maybe to some degree, but in Britain and in Europe, that doesn't exist. So it, what that <clears throat> meant was that we attract a lot of students, we attract students who are interested in different aspects of this history. Some are interested in African history, some are interested in Caribbean history. You know, we had students, I mean, at the moment, I have a student from the US who's very interested in African American history. We have students who want to focus on Britain. We bring all those students together. They uh, discuss with each other, they exchange experiences. That's part of what um, this, our particular approach to history. So that's unique. Yeah. You know, earlier on, on the university tried to say, oh, well, there's these other courses in the country. Uh, well, there aren't. There aren't. Now, why aren't there? Well, because of the way in which this history is regarded. If we just take, for example, the history of African and Caribbean people in Britain, which is of a growing interest. Mm. Think about um, the vast majority of my PhD students are actually working on Britain. Mm. There is no degree course in this country which focuses on the history of African and Caribbean people in Britain. There's no degree course at undergraduate level or at master's level. Mm. It just doesn't exist. Is it taught as part of wider degree programs there are as a module here or a module there mm, yeah. but that has generally only been done post 2020. Mm. Um, oh, all right uh, i don't know why there's that coincidence but there is <laughs> and um you know it's kind of many of the people who are without without in any way being critical of them many of the people who are teaching those courses are you know quite young scholars generally just coming into the, the their work and so on you know i've been doing this for you know 30 odd years mm. so i've you know just produced a widely acclaimed and award-winning book on the subject so again for the university to um, as i say to replace me is very difficult but to go back to the question you know we we live in a a rather Eurocentric mm -hmm. environment um, where history is often presented from the perspective of the, the white men of property. <clears throat> and to widen that, to make history more inclusive, is a kind of ongoing struggle mm -hmm. that some of us have been, you know, fighting on this question again for over 30, 30 years to say to people, well, the history of Britain actually includes, um, doesn't just include the white men of property, it includes working people, it includes women. It includes people of African, Caribbean, Asian heritage. It's important that the history of Britain includes not just people of those origins of that heritage, but also the relationship that Britain had with these other parts of the world, particularly in the last 500 years, but mm. even going back thousands of years. Yeah. Because you have to understand the history of Britain in its totality and why, because really history is about today. Yeah. You know, it's, history is not really about, it is about, obviously it's about the past, but it's about understanding the past in order to understand where we are today in the world, why the world is the way it is. And so you have to include everything in order to do that. And yet we don't yet have that at university level. We don't yet have it at school no. level. It's because we don't, as I said earlier, that so many young people are alienated from history and from, you know, find it, it doesn't speak to them. And let me just give you an anecdote. When I first joined the University of Chichester, I taught a course called Africa and the African Diaspora in the Modern World, which was a first year survey course. It dealt with a bit about some African history. It dealt with uh, African American history, some British history, some Caribbean history. We looked at, you know, Africa in some 1500. We talked about 
human trafficking. We talked about everything. Oh, wow. Yeah. That module in 12 weeks. Okay, so that module, which I taught to first year students at the University of Chichester. Now, anyone knows anything about that university, one thing you would know about it is it's a very monocultural university. Probably it was even more so in 2012. They were all white students, young white students. I taught that module in my first few weeks at the university and the students voted it module of the year. All my colleagues were like, you've only just come here. Like, What's going on? They're writing you a module. And the students said, we've never had this history before. Isn't it exciting? Isn't it interesting? Isn't it fascinating? We want to know. We want to know about all these different things and so on. And so this is part of young people, any people understanding themselves, understanding the world they're in, why it is the way it is, it's important for everybody. Mm. Um, but we don't have that, generally speaking, in schools and universities. There's some improvement, but there's still a long way to go. And so setting up a course at master's level was to kind of, as I said, to redress the imbalance which exists um, with this lack of history. and. As a consequence, the lack of students from Af African and Caribbean heritage. So, yeah, that's the problem that we still confront. And losing this course sets us back, you know, sets us back 12 years. And that's the tragedy of it. You know, it's a personal tragedy for me because mm -hmm. I've labored for 12 years yeah. to establish all this and the university has smashed it all. But for, for everybody, it's a, it's a disaster because it doesn't mm -hmm. exist. Mm -hmm. If you want to study this now, if you want to train, if you want to train as a historian, if you want to carry out research, if you want to, you've got nowhere to go. Yeah. Nowhere to go. So I'm like, you know, I'm going to just come back to this because, um, you know, I mentioned that, you know, I did get a statement from the University of Chichester and I just want to read out the a section of their statement, which, you know, we'll just sort of come back to in terms of, you know the how the education system is currently going at the moment uh, apologies also if you can hear uh, the police sirens behind me um so it says since the program launched in 2017 the university has invested over 700,000 pounds into the cost of delivery of this program including staff and salary costs during the same period the university has received uh, around 150,000 pounds of tuition fees this gap between income and expenditure means other areas would have to be uh, would have to subsidize the program's costs to the detriment of those other programs and their students. This would not be sustainable, and the university has had to come to a difficult decision to spend a number of programs that fit into this category, of which the Eberes is one. And you know, for me, I, I thought that was kind of slightly shocking because it, it was like, are we heading towards the Americanization? of our university system uh, because the focus is so heavily on the funding side instead of, as you said, readdressing this massive gap that we've had for centuries. Yeah, well, you see, the first thing I'd say about uh, what you say is perfectly correct. Um, is, is education, whether it's a school or um, you know, does a school take children and say, um, well, hang on a minute, can, can we afford to teach these kids? No, generally speaking. Um, but if we are say, if we, the question is, does the government fund higher education sufficiently? Then no, the answer is, is probably, is certainly no, mm -hmm. it doesn't. Does the government um, and leading politicians put pressure on universities to only teach certain types of courses and say that only certain types of courses are of any value. Yes, it does do that. And therefore, when universities might be because of maybe because they're also because of their own mismanagement and bad decisions in the past find themselves in economic difficulties, do they therefore lean to cutting certain types of courses, very often humanities courses, very often history courses? Mm -hmm. Yes, that does happen. You know, it's not the first time I've been made redundant. The last university I was at closed the whole history and politics department in one. So what? That's, that's the world in which we live. But then we have to get into the specifics of this 
calls and we can analyze the university state. First of all, if you claim that you've invested 700,000 pounds in a course, everybody is going to say, okay, what have you done with that money? What have you done? With it? And uh, I can tell you without being very you know, confidential about it, the 700,000 in terms of my salary, they keep saying from seven, no, no, 2017, the course actually started in 2018. So they don't even get that right. Uh, but the course ran for about five years. And so my salary doesn't even come to half of the 700,000 pounds. Mm. If we look at the salaries of the vice chancellor of the university, the vice chancellor earns 185,000 a year. So, um, and the senior managers, similar figures. So that 700,000 doesn't even pay the salaries of the senior managers, the six senior managers in the university for one year. Mm. So it sounds like, a, you know, you one has to get the, it into context and proportion. Okay, so half of it is my salary. Okay, why is the other half? Mm. The course was completely online. There's no classroom. Oh. So. Now, you could say, okay, well, some of that, therefore, is probably for the librarian. It's probably for the IT people. It's probably for the... But the... Even my salary is not just, I'm not just paid to teach on the MRAs. Yeah. I supervise PhD students. I do other work at the university. The librarian doesn't just supply books for that one course. Mm. She or he or they, the whole library staff. So if you break it, if it's paying for salaries of people who assist with that course, including admin staff, yes, of course, that's a big figure. But they don't only do that. You yeah. can't say this is only spent on this course. Then it gives the impression that it's it's it, this is money which was kind of used to promote the course. But of course it wasn't. The university didn't do any marketing or promotion of the course other than to put it on its website and to put it in its prospectus. Now, who in the world is going to look in the prospectus of the University of Chichester to find a course on the history of Africa and the African diaspora? No, because most people haven't even heard of the University of Chichester or even heard of Chichester. In other countries, people can't even pronounce Chichester. They struggle to pronounce the word. Every year of the course, I used to go to my um, line manager and say, we need more promotion. We need to publicize it in a particular yeah. way. And it was never done. The only time that I'm aware of that somebody was employed to market the course was one of my PhD students who was given a few hundred pounds or maybe not even a few hundred pounds, a few pounds to go on Twitter for a month and publicize the course. So listen, if you say this course did not have enough students uh, and did not bring in enough income, the answer is very simple. You marketed more. Yeah. The university is saying this at a time when thousands of people for the first time got to know about this course. Yeah, yeah. 12,000 people signed a petition saying <laughs> we want this course. Some of them saying we never knew about it. You know, we, whatever. It was an ideal moment for the university to say, oh, well, maybe we made a mistake here. Um, let's review everything. There are yeah. thousands of people are actually interested in it. Let's carry on. Let's run it. The MP, Bel Ribeiro Addy, went to the university and said, look, I'm the chair of the All Party uh, Committee on African Reparations. We would definitely like to work with the okay. university around this course. There's synergies, there's things we can do together. The university told her to get lost. Somebody else, who you, uh, I don't know whether you listened to the press conference the other day, Zainab Abbas, who used to run a PR company for years, went to the university and said, look, I can market this course for you and I will do so at no cost. Mm. I didn't even respond to her email. Right. If the university were really concerned about making money from this course, a course which people all over the world are now clamoring for, other universities are approaching me saying, can we get this course? We can make money out of it. If they, the University of Chichester was really interested, they would have taken all of these opportunities. Uh, and, but they didn't do that. They just said, oh, no. You know. So 
as I say, putting all this into context, this figure mean, is absolutely meaningless. And we know from freedom of information uh, material that the university thinks that this particular, uh, these particular figures are what's going to shut everybody up. They think, oh, yeah, we just mentioned this 700,000, 100,000, that'll keep everybody poor. That's what they think. But once you actually break it down, it becomes completely meaningless. And as you say, um, you can't redress the imbalance of centuries in five years mm. in a cause that you do not promote, that you do not market, and then somehow you know use that as an excuse to get rid of a particular member of staff, which is basically what, they, what they've done, and claim that, oh, well, it's just all about figures and numbers and so on. It, it just doesn't add up. So but anyway, that's the answer to your to your question. Yeah, no, you're, you're correct. And, you know, I, I, I have to get on to your incredible book, which obviously I read this week, and I was very excited to read, as you say, it's a, a part of history that we haven't been taught. And, you know, I was at SOAS and, um, and I, I didn't hear any of this. So I was just in, so your book is obviously African and Caribbean people in Britain, a history. And so I wanted, and obviously it's been nominated for the Wolfson Prize, which is a huge deal. And so I wanted to ask first of all, so why do you think we have such a narrow viewpoint of the African and Caribbean anti-slavery mo movements in the past? Because there was so much I, like, I didn't know about, and it was really wonderful to see a multi-continent approach to it, um, the movement. Why don't we know about it? Well, because history is very often taught from a very narrow perspective. Um, you know, I said earlier that it's very often taught from the perspective of, you know, the white men of property. Now, obviously, not everybody does that. And there are lots of people up and down the country who would, you know, be saying, well, we don't do that. We try and include everybody and so on. And of course, people are trying. But the, the point I'm making is that is the kind of dominant narrative. Um, and it's, you know, it's kind of reaffirmed at various times, as we saw over the, you know, the Colston statue and all this kind of thing. That, you, know, you know, this is the history. This is the history. It's the history of the white men of property. How can anybody, you know, disregard it or criticize it or remove it? Or this is absolutely shocking. And this is not our history. This is the history of this minority of people who have carried out all kind of crimes against everybody um there is a history of the people of this country in general you know and that is the history which is uh, it's the history of most of us that we should be concerned with not the history of just a few a handful of you know people and but unfortunately um, because that, that dominant narrative exists, then other people have been, or the majority of us have been kind of written out of history. And so the book is an attempt, an attempt to try and look at this history again from a different perspective. And it, it's obviously it's a quite a big book, but it's, it's just kind of scratching the surface in a way. It's trying to give people a survey of the latest research on the subject and present it in a readable way. Of course, there's much more depth that we can go into. But it tries to highlight some, you know, important things. And you, you kind of alluded to the whole question of you know, anti-slavery, anti-racism and so on, which is very, very important. And even that is distorted. Mm. Because, again, it's presented as the history of the white men of property. So it's all about Wilberforce. It's all about the mother of all parliaments. Yeah. Look at did. But if you present it in that way, you, you don't you can't explain anything. You know, why did Parliament seven years into the nineteenth century, a parliament in a country that had led the world in human trafficking in the eighteenth century, why did it suddenly become the leading leading abolitionist? You, you have to explain that. And it can't just be because of the mother of all parliaments changed its mind. So you have to try and explain some of that, you know, what goes on. Some of that happened in Britain. Some of it happened in other places. Some of it, a lot of it, was due to the role of Africans themselves, mm. who, you know, organised themselves and 
rose up in revolution in Haiti and in rebellion in various other places. And anyway, so all of that is explained in the book. But what is often forgotten, left out of it, is that the majority of people are left out of the history. So in the 18th century and the 19th century, but in the 18th century, we have one of the earliest mass political movements in this country is the anti slavery or anti-slave trade, anti-human trafficking movement. You know, this is just a fact. That for some years, uh, before it was actually suppressed by the white men of property, mm. this movement involved millions of people in this country. People signed petitions. And, it, and again, it highlights something important, that the majority of people in the country in the 18th century didn't have a vote, didn't have any political rights, generally speaking, but what they could do, they did. They signed petitions, they boycotted sugar, mm. they held meetings. They, and this is a movement that involved working people. It involved people in the new towns like Manchester. It involved women. It involved Africans, people mm. fighting together. And you listen to the, the leading representatives of it. Um, you know, people like uh, you know, Thomas Spence, who was one of the leaders of the London Corresponding Society. They, give you the politics of the day. If you are for the rights of Africans, you must be for the rights of man. If you're for the rights of man, you must be, when they say the rights of man, they mean the rights of people, human rights. You must be for the rights of Africans. In other words, you must be for the rights of all. Mm. That was the politics of the working people of this country. Even in the 21st century, people don't. some people don't yet understand this politics. They had it 200 years ago. Isn't this like a high point in Britain's history? Mm. That everybody should celebrate. But this is suppressed. Nobody generally knows or talks about this movement. So then you distort everything. And the powers that be saying, oh, everyone's always critical of our history. Aren't we unpatriotic? No, we're not unpatriotic. We're very patriotic. Mm. Yeah. This is our history. We want to celebrate it. We don't want to celebrate some criminals who carry, you know, carried out, attacked people and murdered people and all this kind of thing. So, but when you don't have that history of Britain, including Africans and others, then it confuses people. People, you know, I'll give you a, an anecdote from a few years ago. At the time of the parliamentary abolition, I was talking to a young, well, youngish history teacher, a young English white woman and she said to me oh, all this uh, teaching about abolition and slavery you know, is all very difficult and so I said is it I said why is it difficult she said, oh well you know I feel so guilty and this and that I said really why, why would you feel guilty I said, well you know my ancestors you know enslaved you know probably a bit more. I said look I said it's more likely that your ancestors were uh, signing petitions against human trafficking, mm -hmm. boycotting sugar in their tea, organizing meetings and, you know, whatever, or helping Africans to escape up and down the country. It's more likely that they were doing that mm -hmm. than they were enslaving anybody. Oh, she said, oh, oh. Yeah. So <laughs> immediately you actually examine the history. People have a completely different mm -hmm. attitude, a completely different perspective on their own life, on their own part, place in the world. And this is why the powers that be spend so much time attacking history, distorting history, because they don't want people to have this outlook. Mm. Um, because if you have that outlook, you immediately, you immediately, you know, you stand up tall. You realize that, oh, okay, well, this is our history. This is our tradition. This is what we have to be proud of. This is what we have to carry on. So. Whereas they try to spread, you know, confusion and division and all negativity and so on. So this history is very important for everybody to understand. And obviously there are some other aspects that may not be so positive and so on, but one has to look at the context of circumstances. And um, one of the things I actually tried to do in the book, I couldn't do it at great length, but I tried to look at the kind of anti-racist movement in this mm -hmm. country. Yeah. Even in, even in the 17th century. Yeah. You have the anti racists People are saying, on a minute, they're enslaving other human beings. This is, uh, this is um, like, uh, well, what word they use, like blasphemous. 
this is against God's will mm. because these people are being created by God. They are they're human beings like us. So how can we be enslaving them and saying they're not human beings? This is, they put it in all kind of different ways according mm. to the you know conditions of the time. But people stood up and, and defended these things, you know. And uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, even in the anti-slavery movement, you have people like Adam Smith. Mm. Took a very good stand. It's the day people use Adam Smith's name to do the most reactionary yeah. things and present the most reactionary ideas. Adam Smith was, uh, you know, uh, anti-slavery. Spoke up against for the people of revolutionaries in in Haiti. Called said they're all heroes. And, you know, so let's let's put everything in its context. Mm. So the book does some of that, uh, or tries to do some of that, as well as telling a more general history of um, you know, the period from thousands of years ago up until now. And of course, one of the things the book starts with is with, with Cheddar Man, so-called, yeah. um, who wasn't an African as such, in, only in the sense that everybody's African, Yeah. Um, but was, you know, to, to use the phrase of the Daily Telegraph, and who, who would argue with the Daily Telegraph, um, was one of the, the, the first Britons, you know, that uh, 10,000 years ago, everybody in Britain looked like Cheddar Man, meaning they were dark skinned, yeah. dark haired, and with, but with blue eyes. I That's mean, crazy. this is just a fact. Yeah. In fact, everybody in Europe looked like that. Wow. So let's get everything into context and look at our history a little bit differently and be open minded and. And yeah, I mean, I remember years ago we wrote something, I put it in the book, in a way that I'm going to start the book by saying that some people got all, you know, up in arms when it was said that, you know, Africans were here before the English and so on. But I mean, Africans were here before the English. If you think the English are Angles, if you, if you take the view that English are Angles and Saxons, which yeah. might not even be correct, but if that's what you take, well, then obviously there were Africans here in Roman times and before of Roman course. times. And, yeah. and the other interesting thing we find about all this is that when you actually start to, to, to look for Africans, then you find them. Mm. When you say, no, they weren't here, then you don't find them. And we're finding that, particularly with DNA, investigations well, you know dna sounds a little bit technical a bit scientific a bit confusing, but actually it helps us understand all kinds of things and one of the things i mentioned in the book is people have started to look at it's expensive that's the problem it's a bit like chichester's approach <laughs> or the or my union's approach oh, we can't do this it's a bit too a bit too expensive if you if you use that technique to look at skeletons and look at every skeleton, then you start finding, well, there are actually a lot more Africans dying, you know, during the period of the, you know, so-called Black Death, um, ironically named, uh, than you thought there were. Um, I think last year, the skeleton of a young girl was found not far from where I live in Kent, oh. uh, from the seventh century. Wow. It did the DNA analysis and said, oh, this girl's genes or DNA came from West Africa. Um, actually, they actually came from what is today Nigeria. Oh, wow. Oh, actually, they're actually kind of Yoruba genes or Yoruba Oh, DNA. wow, gosh. They said, oh, well, um, maybe she didn't come from West Africa, but probably her father came mm. because she had, you know, she kind of had local DNA as well as Africa. So why is somebody from West Africa in, in England in the 7th century? How did they get there? Why did they? This is like fascinating. And then they said, oh, well, the girl was buried just like all the other people. Well, of course she was. She's a seven-year-old child. How is she going to be buried in the field in Kent in the 7th century? So there's all this idea immediately that, oh, because she was of African heritage, she must have been somehow treated differently from other people. Right. So this is a very modern conception of yeah. things. Well, why would she be? She was a human being. Oh, maybe her father had travelled here. Why did he? Why did he travel? Who knows why he travelled? Or what he done? So, when you look and when you look at things, you find that you know maybe something a little bit different than you thought. 
very exciting um, and it's important to present this history i know that there are various racists who attack my books uh, somebody was telling me yesterday oh they're at it again on youtube saying i'm lying and all this kind of thing so in the book i present every piece of evidence yeah you know i don't know how many pages of footnotes there are reference notes so people could go and look at the research for themselves i'm just presenting it and the racists can say what they like in fact i'm always happy when the racists attack me because i know that, that my book is definitely making an impact <laughs> they're uncomfortable they don't you know whatever so which i try and present all of that all the latest research right up until 2020. Mm, yeah. Uh, um, so you have a whole history of 20th century and yeah, it's all all there. Yeah, it, it was so fascinating. Like um, I, I was one of those people who was like constantly Googling as I was reading it and I was going, oh, who's this person? And who's this person? And oh, what's this incident? So I found it like really fascinating just to be able to be like, oh, wow, there's just so much happening. and. But what I was really struck by was the fact that we had a lot of similar incidents in the UK as the US did much later on. Um, and I'm just wondering also, also at the same time, actually, um, and I was just wondering why we don't hear about our own sort of backyard, what happened in our own backyard, like the Bristol bus boycott, even though we know everything about what's happened in the US one. Yeah, well... Again, that's <laughs> that's uh, unfortunate, you could say, to put it mildly. I think one reason for that is, um, you know, just people are a little bit ignorant or forgetful. Um, and, you know, it's often easier to look at these things in the US. I mean, there, there were, and still are probably, uh, even GCSE level courses on you know, black people in the Americas and African American history. It's you know, you know, so we need to have a bit of uh, you know diversity in our history. Okay, let's say something about America. We know about Martin Luther King and so on, and many young people will tell you that. Oh yeah, Lena, we know about Martin Luther King, but we don't know about Bristol or London or Liverpool. Or... Mm. So it's it's kind of lazy, you know. It's 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 oh, it's acceptable history acceptable to talk about Martin. Everyone's heard of Martin Luther King. But of course, that in itself was a struggle uh, in the US and elsewhere to even get, get that history recognized. And as you probably know, it's now it's under attack in the US. Yeah. People have been told yeah. you can't talk about it anymore. So it's not that we don't want people to know about this important struggle in the US. But yes, people also struggled here. Racism in this was legal in this country until roughly the same time as in the US, 1965. Yeah. Um, to such a degree, I mean, people always talk about 1948 and some boat arriving. I don't know why they think that's particularly important. Lots of boats arrive uh, different times, mm. before that time, after that time. But 1948 was actually a very important year for breaching what had existed before a color bar which existed in this country mm. not just in the street in sport you know in in sport in this country in boxing did, yeah. a person of color could not compete for a british title until 1948 that wasn't because a boat arrived i'm going to assure you so people have thought why was there why was there a ban on people boxing for a time or you couldn't have a black person being British champions, which is to, you know, this would upset the whole colonial order and upset everybody's understanding of the world. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, but that color bar existed. It was part of the, you know, British boxing border control. That's what they did. And it was broken the first time in 1948 uh, by, um, by, uh, I always forget his name, Dick Turpin, one of the Turpin brothers, or three Turpin brothers who were mm. boxers. Um, and so, you know, 1948 is, it actually shows how long people had been around before that, that mm. this color bar was actually broken for the first time in those years. So we have to remember um, some of the difficulties that existed. And of course, that color bar also existed in the armed forces, it existed during mm. the Second World war existed during the first world war it existed um in many areas of life 
if you went into a hotel, you could be refused a room in this country. Um, you could be people could refuse to serve you if you went in a pub or in a restaurant. You could be, as a famous case of the famous American singer, Paul Robeson, singer, actor, and activist, mm. went into the Savoy in 1929. He was asked to leave. This is this is, that, this is in London. This is in the Strand in London. Um, or we go back to the 18th century. People, you know, people go to coffee houses today. Africans were bought and sold in coffee houses, in this country, in Liverpool, in London, in Bristol, in Glasgow. And this is British history. So you can't run away from it. That's what it was. Let us understand it. When we say that people were sold, yes, there were some people who sold Africa. There were other people who helped Africans to escape, who helped them to run away, who, you know, not all Africans who were here in the 18th century were enslaved. You know, some were writers, some were composers, some were political activists, some were whatever. This is just history. Mm -hmm. And we need to know all of it in order to understand, to make sense of everything, make sense of the world we're in today. What is the, why shouldn't people know it? Why should it be hidden? Um, so the book tries to present that and hopefully it will be helpful to people. As you, as you did, people can look at things. Oh yeah, okay, that's interesting. And it will be a resource for, for teachers and for, you know, just people to, to delve into things. Um, of course, now we have the internet. It's much easier to find things. But sometimes you need a kind of guide as to what to look for, and where to look for it. And the book hopefully provides, you know, that kind of guidance for people as well. Well, it definitely did for me because, uh, exactly, I, I think I would need a basis in terms of trying to find some of, some of these events and incidents that took place uh, because if you don't know about it then how would you search for it so but what do you think is the most important sort of takeaways from the book oh that's a good one um well i think some of the things that i've mentioned already that is you know it's a very very long history mm -hmm. and people shouldn't think about 1948 very much if at all <laughs> Not at all. Uh, it's not very significant um, at all. So that's one thing, I think. Secondly, I think people should understand that history is about change, that everything changes. And uh, Cheddar Man is a kind of good symbol of that change, that 10,000 years ago, everybody looked like him. Today, people look a bit different. So, you know, everything changes. I think the third thing is that it demonstrates in various ways that that change is not just something outside of our control, but that we as human beings are agents of change. Mm. Uh, we can change things, um, particularly, you know, politically, economically, and so on. We are the, we are the agents of change, and we should um, understand that a little bit more and have more confidence in our our historical ability, if you like, our historic role to change things for the better. Um, and then I think that there's also the issue of, again, what I talked about, that there's there's been, you know, for many centuries in this country, a, a sort of tradition of anti-racism, mm. anti-slavery, people standing up for their, for the human rights of all and working together and trying to get on and solve things and so on. And um, this came up in an interview the other day in a, in a, from a kind of very reactionary standpoint. But if you actually look at the history of Africans in this country or people of African Caribbean heritage, one of the characteristics of it is that they're, they're um, particularly in previous centuries, very often mainly male, although not entirely male, because there are women around as well. But one of the interesting things is that people intermarried or mm -hmm. had, you know, lived, had sexual relations to, to be very blunt about it with each other. And that's very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, that tells you a lot about human beings. <clears throat> that human beings, generally speaking, tend to get on with each other. Um, they tend to 
they tend to be fascinated by each other. They fall in love with each other. They're sexually attracted to each other. Mm. Um, they're not divided in the way that perhaps we think. You know, we, we rather like the young girl who was buried the same way as every other one. We, we can see probably from that burial and even that existence of that child that probably her father came from Africa and her mother came from Kent. Mm. Probably, probably. So even if we go back that far, that was the way that human beings interacted. That, that's quite an, a powerful thing in a way because it tells us something about how people are as human beings and the, the sort of racism which is in some ways very much a, a characteristic of the narrative of the 20th century in the book but time and time again you you know find these kind of terrible things going on but these terrible things are perpetrated by very few people very often by government yeah. by the agencies of government like the police by the various kind of racist organizations. These are the people who carry out these kind of crimes. Sometimes, you know, trade union leaders have been uh, involved in these things. Um, these are the people who are the troublemakers. Whereas the other people are, you know, trying to get on with their lives, trying to solve their problems, working together to try and solve them. Sometimes a bit confused about. Mm -hmm you know, who, who, what the problem is or who the problem is and so on, but kind of learning to experience and so on. So I think that that's an important um, sort of lesson as well. Um, but of course, sometimes terrible things happen and people are engaged in those terrible things. But there is also this, like I say, this kind of traditional, this thread of um, people trying to work together, people trying to live together, people recognizing that they have common interests, common aims, common enemies mm. as well, very often. Um, I think that sort of, you know, hopefully runs through the book as well. And also that um, particularly African and Caribbean people in this country over the last century centuries has been a history of struggle mm. uh, just like we could say the history of women in this country mm. has been a history of struggle or history of working people in this country has been a history of struggle mm. and often those struggles have coincided yeah and been you know launched you know or, or operated together it's interesting that if we look at the sort of anti-slavery movement of the 19th century, it was often women who were at the forefront of it, who were the most radical and so on. But um, just looking at those of African and Caribbean heritage, it's a tradition of struggle, of uh, struggle for, for rights and so on alongside others. And that's also important to, to celebrate, I think. Um, and it's, it's often forgotten about the attempts to write it out of history that the struggle is you know kind of an integral part of history mm. and historical narratives and um, people um, taking out issues to try and solve them that is an important part of the history and it's good to look at that and learn the lessons of it see who those people were who Took us, took a stand, and did good things, and uh, we should be celebrated. Sometimes you, you work out who the criminals were, and they should be condemned, and, uh, and so on. So that that that's important as well, I think. That's yeah, I'm um, like definitely, and I think you've also mentioned, you know, uh, some of the the agencies that have caused a lot of problems. Uh, it, even uh, you know, I remember reading about you know the Stephen Lawrence murder in the book and Doreen Lawrence having been spied upon during this time which was just horrific and so what do you think are some of the challenges that uh, African and Caribbean people in Britain still face today? Well I mean again you put your finger on it there I mean that case is still is ongoing yeah. it's ongoing that's the crazy thing that comes out of the book and I have to say that 
that was probably you asked me a, f a few moments ago or a few questions ago what were the challenges and i must say that working on the 20th century was one of the most challenging mm -hmm. and actually that's my time period that's what i actually normally work on so it's not like i don't know the history but when you have to write it mm -hmm. sort of year after year uh, as it were decade after decade and you see it's the same problem mm -hmm. of racism very often in fact it almost entirely actually state racism time and time and time again and the lot Stephen Lawrence case is a perfect example of that that okay you have some you know whatever some riffraff you know who carried out the murder that that's bad enough you know everybody everybody's going to recognize this is absolutely tragic thing yeah. a young boy you know completely innocent of any, you know that is bad enough yeah you think but then the way that the state have dealt with this or not dealt with it or hindered it or spied on people or uh, attacked people who were completely innocent, the family, the friend of Stephen Lawrence, not once, not twice, but for 30 odd years, and it's still ongoing. Yeah. You know, it's it's actually, you, it kind of beggars belief that it happens, that we allow it to happen. You know, it's kind of one of those things which is contributed to the particularly the Metropolitan Police, I mean, has, has no credibility at all. No. It has no credibility. And it, what's interesting, I remember when I was young, and you'd say various things about the police, and, um, you know, because the dominant narrative was, the, you know, the police are the police, and they're upholding law and order and so on. You'd sometimes, we, we knew from our own experience when they would be attacked on the streets or whatever, that that wasn't the truth. But you were kind of, um you felt that you were saying it and people would say um, you know, they can't be right but now you say everybody says it that's the system everybody says well, of course they're racist even i think the metropolitan police now say they're racist <laughs> they do and just, think, just yesterday we saw the five police officers ex-police officers who were accused of sending racist whatsapp messages and you know this is a reality it's endemic mm -hmm. it's like the whole organization is completely racist you know it has no credibility and it has no credibility in regard to women either. Yeah. you know so if you think that women are half the population in london i don't know people who are african and caribbean heritage are like probably 20 percent or whatever so the vast majority of like leaving aside just other people who have their experience it's a force that's kind of completely useless not only is it useless it's hostile Mm. And it's been proved time and time and time again to be hostile. But the powers that be, the governments, governments have done nothing. And this is ongoing. I mean, you have to have amazing respect for Baroness Lawrence to yeah. go through this Jesus. for 30 years. Oh, you can't so even imagine. Yeah. You cannot imagine how somebody even gets up in the morning. Yeah and deals with this every year or even like every month something comes up about this case yeah every inquiry has been flawed as it's like every, it's like okay what's the next thing going to be yeah. wasn't it in the news that the other day oh there was a sixth suspect a sixth suspect who's now dead and the police never did anything about it, didn't interview everybody told them people rang them up people gave the photo people gave the address people gave the phone number people gave everything even the the friend of Stephen Lawrence said actually well there were six of them or whatever number it was they did nothing it's you, you can't even I think the BBC uh, uncovered this you're like what what le you know what levels of you, you can't even say it's incompetence. No. You, you can't no. explain it by incompetence. It's it not. has to be like a deliberate aim to... And nobody's uh, held to account. Nobody is... That, that's the even worse thing. Yeah. And all this information comes out. No Home Secretary, no Met Commissioner, nobody is prosecuted. 
no one single person is prosecuted. So that tells you something about, you know, the, the society. And then, of course, you have, you know, the so-called Windrush scandal. Oh, God. Oh, God. Which, again, Just whatever up. aspect you look at, uh, I was reading the other day something about Theresa May, just written autobiography, saying it's it, you know, nothing to do with her. So, I mean, it's just staggering. And yeah. if that's not bad enough, then there's the whole compensation or lack of compensation. If I was talking to Jackie uh, McKenzie yesterday, saying, oh, I'm up in Hull because there's a family who, of, you know, Windrush, you know, there's the, whatever. I can't remember what the issue was. I probably shouldn't go into it anyway. But there was some issue. I mean, it's... I see that Clive Myrie was there mm. in the garden the other day saying it. I mean, it just, <laughs> you can't even find word. And again, nobody is held to account. No, nobody no. takes responsibility. Nobody, everybody says, oh, well, yeah, there was some other problem. This happened. It was this. It was by mistake. It was this. It, it, you, 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 when you read the stories and it's kind of ongoing. Oh, yeah. Definitely. It's on going in terms of the attacks on people, the lack of compensation, lack of compensation the, yeah. the inability to do all the, it's just, you know, this is absolutely staggering. And again, um, this is the like 21st century. Yeah. Um, but we are not, the, the, the key thing is that we are not in a position, we are not in a position to hold these criminals to account that is the key thing that we need to change you know we need to have a situation where we can say okay you carried out this crime over 30 years we are going to hold you to account we're going to demolish this um, this corrupt police force we're going to institute something else we're going to start from the bottom we're going to whatever we're going to do to solve the problem that we need yeah. so that you know in our capital city, people are safe, they're secure, they're this, or whatever it is. So, to me, it raises big political questions. It was very challenging. It was uh, very difficult to write. Because um, I say you're just, you know, from the beginning of the century, in sport, in the armed forces, in, you know, everyday life, in time and time and time and time and time and time again right up to the present day mm. um you're coming up against the same problem so yeah that that was actually quite uh so to say traumatic is a bit maybe a bit strong but yeah it definitely took its toll because it makes you very angry mm. um that you're talking about you know a century and it just keeps going on and no one does anything about it so or nothing is it's not possible with the existing system. Let me just open a window. I'm getting hot. But the existing system to actually solve these problems. That is incredibly, yeah, I say frustrating. Um, you think, well, you read that, the answer's kind of, you know, the, the problem cries out to you. The solution um, cries out, you know. And uh, we haven't got a basically a, a system in this country which are, is allowing any solution to this problem. So that's, yeah, that's quite hard to, uh, to bear. So. Oh, God, I know. I'm sorry. Uh, to end on that, that happy note, um, but yes, no, thank you so much, Professor Addy, for speaking to well, me. Well, just, 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 just to, to say, let's not end on that note, because the book ends in 2020. Yes. That's true. Uh, and 2020 was, you know, that movement up and down the country from Land's End to Johnny Groves. So people saying, well, actually, enough is enough. This isn't acceptable. No. And looking for a way, kind of, you could say, articulating that view exactly that, well, we're fed up with all this. You know? yeah. We're not going to stand for this. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Okay, it may not have, you know, continued in the same spirit, but it, it shows the, the sentiment of people generally to say, yeah, we've had, we've had enough of it. So I think that's a good place to stop. I think you're right. I think you're right. Uh, absolutely. It was, it ended on a positive note. So that was really impo important, I think. And even though it came from obviously a place of 
really deep sadness but it, it the fight the fight against it was incredible um so uh yeah absolutely so thank you so much for speaking with me i had a million other questions but i was like okay <laughs> we could end up talking for hours if i'm not careful um no. so, <laughs> but um but it was absolutely fascinating and i support you all the way and i hope we can see a solution to what's happened so yes yeah we hope so too well i mean hopefully your you know this will help um certainly if you, you know let me know when it goes out we'll certainly promote it in the campaign on social media and try and encourage people to um, support us particularly financially if everybody gives something you know we're going to be in a very good position to to launch the um, legal challenges that we want to yeah uh, carry on the the work i mean it's ongoing work to make sure that this history is taught and studied and uh, available in our schools and universities so that's a bigger sort of movement or campaign or whatever that um, you know we encourage everyone to get involved in that absolutely and uh i've added the link i'll add the links below um so you know everyone can donate to that and i will add that to also the 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 article and also just all the social links because I think that's really important. We need to sort of help with the fund. So thank you so much, Professor Adi. No, and I'll welcome. be, you know, keeping track of what's happening and please do let me know if you hear any developments or anything. No, sure. Definitely. Definitely will.